I'm David Mizell. I work at Cray. Uh, and I'm going to give you a talk about how we've taken an existing database named uh, Lovem and extended it so that it's actually kind of more graphy and uh, better for testing uh, performance on uh, graph oriented databases. So, first, let me get the Always obvious first question out of the way. Yeah, Craze does still exist. We are still out there selling supercomputers. This is one of the big boys, uh, Titan at, uh, at the Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, each one of these cabinets holds about, I think the number is 392 processors. So you multiply that out, you're talking about uh, closing in on 19,000 AMD Opteron processors uh, that have 32 gigs of memory each, and each one of them has an NVIDIA Tesla with it that has uh, six gigs of its own memory also on one node. And it's about a 27 petaflops uh, system and on several Oak Ridge applications it's sustaining 20 petaflops performance and for a hundred million dollars one of these can be yours. Um, I once was given a talk a briefing to a bunch of government people and, and tried to make a joke and said, uh, and if you buy one of these, we'll throw in the electric power substation. And one of the government people said, be careful what you promise. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, uh, work on a, a smaller one than this, and I'll tell you about that a little bit later. But let me give some, you some background on uh, graph databases and the kind of graph database we work on called a triple store. Um, <clears throat> around the year 2000, the World Wide Web Consortium that establishes standards for the internet decided that they would uh, create and spec out a database and a query language for data that was scattered out across the internet. And they used, they, they uh, coined a uh, standard query language that they called Sparkle, and uh, they created a data representation that we refer to as RDF triples. RDF stands for Resource Data Framework, which isn't going to be on the test. Anyway, the data uh, looks like a bunch of URLs. And each of these clumps of three strings here, you can think of as one fact in the database, and all the facts in the database have this sort of representation. Big, long uh, URL sort of blah, blah, and the uh, interesting stuff that distinguishes it down at the end. I grabbed these three triples out of the Lovem database, which I'm going to talk about as we go. It, Lehigh University Benchmark. It's an RDF triples uh, synthetic database uh, designed for uh, testing the performance of RDF triples databases running the Sparkle query language. Okay, now if you look at any of these triple strings here, and I picked the uh, the bottom one, just to kind of break down. What it says is Professor Zero teaches course zero. That's the fact that it holds. And those three strings that, that I was showing you before uh, are categorized as the subject, the predicate, and the object of this fact. Professor Zero is the subject, teaches class is the predicate, and of course Zero is the object. Now, when I, look, when I took English, the predicate included the verb and the object, but they, they didn't write it up that way when they defined Sparkle and RDF. 
And by the way, I, I uh, just as a note, your, your data items don't have to be that verbose. If you're not accessing data from all over the internet, and none of our customers do, uh, if your data is local, you're creating it yourself, you're defining it yourself, you can use shorter data representation, uh, something that looks like URN colon and then the, the name that you want to give the data item. So they, they can be made shorter <clears throat> if, they, if they don't have to be uniquely identified anywhere in the world on the internet. Okay, well if you squint at them just right, you notice that you're, when you're creating these triple strings, you're also creating a part of a graph. Because you can think of the subject as a vertex, and then you can think of the predicate as a label on an edge, a directed edge to the object vertex. So here's that same query Professor Zero teaches course zero, and it's represented as a uh, subject, edge, object, uh, triple out of a graph oriented database. Sparkle, um, I'll put it this way, if, if you know SQL and when you're uh, interviewing for a job the interviewer asks you if you know Sparkle, just say yeah and you can learn it over the weekend. They look a lot like alike. They, they both have unions, they both have joins, they both have filters, they both have group by, uh, order by, they, they're similar. The design of Sparkle was, was uh, derived a lot from, from uh, SQL. Uh, the difference, the most significant difference to me is that uh, in Sparkle, the joins are implicit. In SQL, they go, oh my God, you're about to do a join. Look out for your life. Uh, but that doesn't happen in Sparkle. It's just implicit that you're going to be joining some of these uh, data items. So it, it follows that they don't think it's going to cost a lot. Joins in relational databases typically cost you uh, quite a bit, and in Sparkle you just sort of don't worry about it. So here's an example of a query against the Lubum database. They have a set of 14 queries that you're supposed to benchmark with, and this is one of the more complex ones, query nine. They sh that says, show me all the students who are taking a class taught by their advisor. And so uh, you see these prefix things where instead of writing out the big U long URL thingy, you can abbreviate it with just the RDF colon and then what would fit in right after the pound sign. And we had also had an abbreviation from, for that, that covers all the things that show up and love them. And then it looks sort of like a SQL query, select X, Y, Z, where, and then they're all of type student, faculty, and course, and then X is the advisor, Y, Y teaches course, Z, and X takes course, Z. Okay, you're looking for a triangular relationship. So join, join, join. Implicitly, you've got a three-way join that you've got to compute here, and that gets expensive really quickly, unless you've done, designed a database explicitly to handle that kind of thing. Okay, uh, there are several popular benchmark databases around. I'm mostly talking about Lovem today. Lovem, Lehigh University Benchmark, first published in 2005, and it <clears throat> synthesizes a bunch of data about a university. This professor teaches this course, this student attends this, uh, this student is in this department, so on and so on. And you give it an argument of how many universities you want synthesized. 
<coughs> and it's primarily aimed, the guys that wrote it up at Lehigh were interested in ontologies and semantics. And it's primarily designed to test how powerful your ontology engine is, how well it can reason on the data you're giving. Another one's SP2B, the Sparkle Performance Benchmark. This came out of Freiburg University. And this one synthesizes a bunch of data designed to look like academic publications. It's, they, they model the structure after DBLP, a, a big database that holds a variety of different kinds of, uh, I think it's scientific uh, scholarly publications. And we use this a lot because unlike you, Lovem, it has a whole lot of the, the standard Sparkle operators in it, group by and filter and stuff like that. And so we want, when we want to test our operators, we'll, we'll, we'll run tests with SP2B. There's also VSBM, the Berlin Sparkle, uh, Sparkle Benchmark came out of the Free University in uh, Berlin. And uh, <coughs> we use this least because basically it's the least graphic of any of these out here. Uh, and the proof of that is for every Sparkle query that's in their uh, benchmark query set, there's an equivalent SQL query. So it's regularly structured enough that you can treat it as a relational database. Okay, so what do we do if we want to show how well we can perform on really large, complex graph-oriented structures and do real large or complicated graph-oriented queries on that data, what are the da which database do you use? So you want to match some complicated pattern against a complicated graph. And the answer is none of them. None of them's designed to do that. None of what we had available is designed to test complex graph queries against complex data. The most complex thing you see in those Lovell query set is the one I showed you, that triangular relationship. Show me the students that have take a class taught by their professor, by their advisor professor. Okay, so what we, well, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more about Lovell. Most of the edges in the Lovell database are within a university, and I just stole these hairballs off the internet, but it's more regular than that within a university. It looks pretty relational. This teacher teaches this class, this class, and this class, that kind of thing. Uh, and then there are just a few links between the universities. The only one I remember is that uh, you can look at a university professor and look up which university she or he got his degree from. So that's not very many links between them. In fact, I've seen a company not to be named uh, take 10,000 Lovell universities, ignore the inter-university inter links, and then brag about how fast they were going, running the Lovell queries. Well, excuse me, might as well just use one and then multiply by the number of processors you have. And we're Cray, so we think about doing things in parallel. We run on large or small supercomputers and depend on parallel hardware to get the best performance. So if you're thinking about a graph and running fast in parallel, you've got a fundamental problem. Graphs have little or no locality. When you do a graph computation, there is typically no way to partition the data up. I mean, look at this, this big hairball graph here. Uh, find me a way to carve that up so that each processor has about the same amount of data to work on 
and the links in between any processor and any other processor are minimal. Sorry. You can do it on specialized cases, uh, especially in uh, scientific computation. I mean, they do sparse matrix computations in uh, scientific computations, which are sort of graph-like. But the physics tends to dictate some locality. Uh, if you're doing an aero computation or a chemistry computation, it's the molecules next to the other molecules that have most of the interaction. So most of the work is going on within a processor and they'll, they'll all do a big iteration and then they'll exchange boundary data and then start the next big iteration. The scientific programmer guys call that uh, surface versus volume tricks because the computation they're doing within a processor is order n cubed, and then every once in a while they've got to stop and exchange data with their neighbors, and that's order n squared. So you're doing most of the work inside the process, and you, when you're hopping from a vertex to another vertex in a, in a graph, you don't know where that next vertex is. There's no way to predict if it's on your processor or across the network somewhere. So it's hard to get good, efficient parallelism. Uh, and uh, we work really hard at it, and so we want to be able to brag about it and, and show benchmarks that, that uh, reveal it. <clears throat> All right, I know you didn't come here to hear a product pitch, but it's, it's part of our motivation. So let me spend one slide showing you the box that we sell our graph engine. This is called the Eureka GX, and it's designed to be the cabinet that everybody wants to do big data with. It runs Spark efficiently, it runs Hadoop efficiently, and it runs the Cray Graph Engine, which is the RDF, Triples, Sparkle uh, data store that we've implemented. So you get 48 uh, Intel processors with 32 cores. Uh, some of them are reserved for I.O. and you get to use as an application person, you get to use what, like 41 of them. Uh, you can get up to 512 gigabytes per node. Uh, you get uh, 1.6 terabyte SSD per node. So it's assuming you're gonna use a lot of data. Uh, <clears throat> And it, for the sake of not being able to partition graph data, we use a custom designed uh, interprocessor network, the Cray Ares network. It's, it's high bandwidth, it's low latency, and it's good at one word gets and puts. Um, if you're doing a scientific computation, you can usually send eight words across and amortize the overhead in the network communication. But if you're hopping to the next vertex on the graph, you typically can't do that. You can't cluster up the packet that you're sending over. So it's good to be able to just send one word back and forth. So it's not about throughput? Sorry? So it's not about throughput or about the way to do small data? It ends up being about throughput because uh, in the sense that your network is going to end up being the scarcest resource. And so if you can saturate that resource, you're doing as well as you can. And, and it runs the Craig Graph Engine, which is our RDF Sparkle query engine. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what we want to show off. What we can easily point out is that we can get some serious scalability uh, on the, the uh, Eureka GX on, with our uh, graph engine. Because we've written it to run in parallel at a large scale, Lubum 8K means Lubum synthesized with 8,000 universities. And that's like 1.1 uh, billion edges, 1.1 billion triples in the data set. Lubum 25K 
is around three and a half billion hedges. And level 100K is, it's linear, so it's like, it's like 14 billion triples, 14 billion hedges in the graph. And uh, we, we ran one benchmark where we ran it on our system against, well, I got this slide from our former boss who said it was a Hadoop cluster, and it wasn't. It was just a vanilla cluster with a bunch of grad students hand coding query nine. And uh, they, they still blew up because they had a, a conventional InfiniBand or something uh, network in between the processors. <clears throat> but not only did we want to talk about scalability, we wanted to say something about we can do well when the query is a complex graph-oriented query and the database you're querying against is complex, large, and graph-oriented. Uh, so what we came up with was, we call it LIBOM, the, the Lehigh Extended Benchmark. Let's take the LIBOM data set with the synthetic universities, pick out all the students from it, and then create a social network between the students. So uh, think of a Facebook network. It's just you, you create friends relationships between randomly selected students. And it's dense within a university, and oh, but I went to the high school with this guy that went to this other university. So you have a sparser uh, graph across the universities. And I'm trying to do a kind of a tutorial and a talk here because uh, Lynn Bender kind of suggested that I do it that way that whether it's true or not, I don't know, but not so many people have seen RDF and Sparkle and, and so on. But uh, when you get a social network, it tends to obey what's called a power law distribution, which basically says that the degrees of a vertex, how many edges coming out of a vertex, have an exponential distribution. So if you plot the degrees of the vertex against all of the vertices, uh, the mean might be right about here someplace. And then you have some with uh, fewer vertices than that. And then you've got this really long tail where some, a, a few of the vertices are huge, have huge out degree. And again, think about Facebook. I've got 50 Facebook friends. Beyonce has 5 million. There are these, some of these really popular people in the, in the social network have many more edges going in and out than, than the average. And that just makes it all that much harder to parallelize because you're trying to pick out where to put things and balance the load and then wow, you run into this gigantic uh, vertex. So that's what we do. We take love them and then superimpose this social network on top of it. you assume that the highest popular or popular nodes, you can cut them off and do the improved processing, and you can still predict that they will be connected to all the other nodes? Yeah, yeah, they are. They're, in a statistical sense, they're connected to almost everybody else. We can just skip the outliers on We don't skip. Yeah. It's not a hundred percent true if you do that, but it's it's a, a reasonable thing in some situations to do that. I've seen Yeah, I've seen strategies like that. Let's just skip the the, the huge nodes do everything else in parallel, and then come back and do the huge notes in parallel. Okay. 
Okay, um, a popular way to generate, generate power law graphs is called RMAT, re recursive matrix. It's a, it's a cool little uh, algorithm uh, invented by, uh, I don't know, I'm blanking on his name, uh, Christos Falutsos and his students at Carnegie Mellon. But you, you start out and you create uh, an adjacency matrix. So every row of the matrix is some vertex and then every column of the matrix is the same set of vertices. And let's say it has a one in an entry if there's an edge from that, from that row to that, to that column, or from that vertex to this other vertex. Okay, so you get your eight adjacency matrix, you divide it up into quadrants, and then you throw a dart at it, and the dart is biased to land in the upper left 40% of the time, and the upper right 15% of the time, and so on. So it lands in one of those, let's say it landed in quadrant B. You divide down to that quadrant and throw the bias dart again just at that quadrant, and it'll pick one of those with some probability, and you narrow down until you get to a single uh, cell in the matrix, and then you draw an edge. And then you, you can establish mathematically that that gives you this exponential distribution between the degree of, or a pro close, close approximation, it gives you a, a, a synthesized power law distribution of, of uh, uh, vertex degrees. This is the generator of friends, is that it? That's exactly right, yeah. We use this to generate the fringe and we use it within a, a university with one uh, set of arguments, and then we use it out to all the other universities with a smaller, sparser set of arguments. So here's an example. I just did a uh, head on uh, uh, Liebum 2, which is just, just synthesize two universities and then create uh, the parallel graph between the students, just to show you what, what the data looks like. So there's a, here's a triple that says grad student, undergrad 417 is friends with, has friend undergrad 667. And uh, we're really assuming an undirected graph here. So to do that, everything's symmetric. 667 has also had uh, friends with with 417. So we assuming that the friendship relationship is symmetric, which is true for most people, not Vladimir Putin, but most everybody else. And uh, I just took the numbers when I uh, ran the synthesis program. I, I synthesized uh, love on 1,000. It has about 140 million uh, edges in it, 140 million triples. And then I took that and I synthesized the friends network on top of it, and it added another 80 million. So you add like 60% uh, more triples when you uh, superimpose the Lieben data set on top. Where's the typo? What? Where's the typo? 140 I thought your extended was that one. Oh, add those, and that's what the combined one. That's just how many you're adding. All right, and then we wrote some uh, queries that were more graph-oriented than uh, than what we had in the in the Lovell query data set. Like, here's one of my favorites. Uh, show me a student that takes a class taught by some professor. And then see if that student is friends with another student who is attending where that professor did his or her undergrad. So maybe they can dig up some dirt on them back at their alma mater that, that uh, I can leverage with. And this is, this is six joints now. This is a hexagonal relationship. This guy, student takes his class, taught by this professor, this professor went here, he has a friend that went here, and so on. So, complicated joinery there. Now, 
This is a work in progress, and I put the translation of that down at the bottom. I didn't get everything done in time for this meeting today. Uh, we've actually written our Leibniz generator twice now. Uh, the first time we wrote it, we wrote it in Cray's dialect of, of C++ and it wouldn't pour it anywhere. But we'd like to get it out to, into the public. So we've rewritten it in Java and I'm, I'm just not done testing and creating benchmarks and so on with the Java version. But what we want to do is give it to Lehigh and the group there that manages and maintains love them could also uh, maintain uh, the, the Lebo synthesizer. Uh, and so we're hoping that, that uh, early this year sometime we'll have love them and leave them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any questions I can answer? Yeah. So, what business decision has Cray made based on those benchmarks? Or is it more for customers? It's really for customers. Now, when you make your job implementation, I assume when you did the C plus plus version, uh, you did it across the your uh, your flagship product, the, uh, the Eureka, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you do the Java implementation, are you going to compare the benchmarks to make sure it produces apples and apples? No, we're we're we're, we're changing this one. Um, we gave it more parameters because we want more control over how dense the friends relationship is within a university versus how dense it is outside the university. So uh, that first version never went public anyway. So we're just kind of kind of uh, let it hit the dumpster okay. and uh, just tr try to make the Java work with, uh, version be useful to people. Does the uh, benchmark so it has the data generator piece to it, um, and then you have a set of queries? Do you also have like some sort of driver that's driving a certain benchmarking load on the system, like simulating parallel queries or these one-off queries that you're mm. shooting at the system? Does that make sense? Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, um, like uh, you know, different mixtures of. Or what is the actual we, run book like? We, we do one at a time. Okay. And okay. you can think of the run book as just being a sequence of queries, maybe updates or something that we're going to send to the system. Um, we still think about whether or not we could uh, do two queries that are read only queries at the same time or more than two. Uh, but we're a graph-oriented database, memory resident database, trying to be as fast as possible. And uh, the only way that we know how to do that is to get data parallelism out of it. And uh, what we have stuck with so far is one query at a time. Okay. And then how are your customers using it as an application? So are they serving transactional loads or is it really just for analytics? It's really for analytics because for a transactional load, you, you're going to want to do many updates a second. All right, well, I'll let you out early, I guess. <laughs> Thank you.